I'm Alice Loxton and I present documentaries over on History Hit TV. If you're passionate about all things history, sign up to History Hit TV. It's like Netflix, but just for history. We've got hours of ad-free documentaries about all aspects of the past. You can get a huge discount from History Hit TV. Make sure you check out the details below and use the code ABSOLUTEHISTORY, all one word when you sign up. Now, on with the show. Over 2,000 years ago, the first great European capital cities rose around the shores of the Mediterranean. More and more people lived in increasingly crowded conditions. The arts, commerce and sciences flourished. Struggling for power and influence, these cities tried to outshine each other by erecting magnificent buildings. People from different cultures and parts of the world were drawn to these cities, seeking prosperity and happiness. The incomparable rise of Athens began 500 years before the birth of Christ. No other city has shaped the Western world so much as Athens. History's most famous philosophers lived and taught here. The fine arts and natural sciences blossomed. And it was the citizens of Athens who gave the world a new type of government, democracy. The Greek historian Pausanias wrote about an extraordinary woman of that era. Phryne was one of Athens' most famous iteri, or courtesans. The mistress of important men, scholars, artists and politicians fell under her spell. Her wealth and beauty were legendary. But pride led her into mortal danger. Phryne angered the gods, but it was mortals who would judge her. In the 5th century BC, 300,000 people lived in Athens. The city was at its peak. Then came a long period of decline. And it was only in the 20th century that Athens regained its previous size. Today, it has over 4 million inhabitants. It's just after sunrise. Architect Nikos Togonidis is expecting a special delivery. On the truck is a marble block weighing a ton for one of history's most exciting restoration projects. It has to be hoisted 150 meters up the rocky slope of the Acropolis, or citadel, which was the impregnable center of ancient Athens. The Acropolis is crowned by the city's most famous building, the Parthenon which the Athenians built to celebrate their victory in 479 BC over the Persians. 2,500 years later, this monument is being taken apart and reassembled. 
to rectify the mistakes of 19th century restorations. The Parthenon was the most outstanding building of its time. A two-story high gallery of columns supported the roof of this temple, erected by the citizens in honor of Athene, the goddess of victory. In the huge entrance hall stood her statue, 12 meters high, decorated with gold and ivory. Today's workshops are exactly where the original workers' huts once stood. After the restoration, the Parthenon will still have its familiar look of a ruin. The approach is to repair or complete the damaged parts and to use newly sculpted marble blocks only when absolutely necessary. It's amazing in every point. As a, we are studying and we are working all these years close to the monument, we are discovering again the same techniques. It's, we are obliged to do the same things because we, we understand finally that it's the best way to do that. Piece by piece, the Parthenon is being dismantled. This is the only way the architectural sins of previous restorations can be corrected. Today's architects aim to make their work as historically accurate as possible. Their respect for the tremendous technical and logistical achievements of the ancient builders increases every day. Knowing all these um, facilities that we have in our hands, papers, computers, whatever, how difficult it is to organize and to control all these things. I cannot imagine that period without paper, imagine where they were drawing, how they can communicate and to do this fine work. It's incredible. The Parthenon was built in 15 years, beginning in 447 BC. The Greek philosophers were laying the foundations of the modern sciences. Pythagoras had developed the basic principles of mathematics and Democritus would soon declare the atom to be the foundation of all things. The Parthenon is proof of the superb building techniques of the ancient Greeks. The sides of these columns are tapered. If extended, the sides would eventually meet at a point several kilometers in the sky. So none of the columns is truly vertical. Yet they are all executed precisely to the millimeter. Every stone has secrets, let's say. <laughs> Uh, from the architectural point of view, and the proportions are special, and also there are other things about the, the function, the, the real function of the building. How it's the penetrating the water, for instance. The curvature of the floor, probably it's one of these reasons. Uh, the material that they use uh, to connect the blocks between them, the metal elements, I mean. The technique is uh, similar than the, uh, than the metal work uh, of the Sarakinian swords, for instance. The ancient builders achieved these perfect proportions using only geometric calculations. Compass, ruler and plumb line were their only tools. While the Acropolis was the place to honor democracy with magnificent monuments, it was put into practice at the foot of the hill in the Agora. The Agora was the marketplace of ancient Athens. In the city center, archaeologists from the American School of Classical Studies have been working for the past 70 years. They have unearthed a densely built up residential area at the edge of the Agora. Professor John Camp leads the excavations. The purpose of the excavations is to uncover the center of ancient Athens, that is where the public life took place, uh, and around the big square, which was the Agora proper, there were all the public buildings you needed to run the city. The Senate building, the archive building, the magistrate's offices, the law courts, the mint, pretty much everything you needed in an administrative way 
was somewhere near the square. And our purpose is to expose the historic center of Athens. The Agora was the social and political meeting place of the Athenians. People came to see and to be seen. The history of Phryne begins on the Agora. Phryne has achieved wealth and status through her beauty and intelligence. Her success has aroused envy, and rumors have spread that could prove dangerous to her. Phryne is used to curiosity, but she has no inkling of the scandal that is brewing. She's being accused of a capital offence, blasphemy. She is rumoured to have commissioned the sculptor Praxiteles to create a statue of the goddess Aphrodite in her own likeness. The representation of nude bodies or even erotic scenes was not frowned upon by ancient Athenians. But for an Itera to be portrayed as the goddess of beauty would surely bring divine wrath upon the city. In ancient times, the Agora was an open square shaded by trees and surrounded by spacious arcades. A restored version of such an arcade, the two-story Stoa of Attalos, now houses the American School of Classical Studies. Here, in the shade, the Athenian merchants had their stalls, and citizens gathered to exchange news and gossip. Nowadays, the finds from the Agora excavations are examined and archived here at the Institute. The square itself was used for a variety of functions. One day they might set up booths and have a market. On another day they might be using it for an election. Another time it could be for athletic contests, for military drill for festivals, for, for spectacles of all sorts. So it would be used for a variety of purposes uh, every single day, but not always the same purpose. And then around it in the, in the buildings is simply where the city was managed by the magistrates, by the bully or the senate of the 500, uh, and by the boards and commissions, the water commissioners, the grain commissioners, all the people responsible for running this huge city had their, their administrative offices somewhere right next to the square. Even in a large city like Athens, the Agora functioned as a village square. Direct communication between citizens was the basis for the development of democracy. The archaeologists have found a deep well at the edge of the Agora. It was dug at the time the Parthenon was built. Professor Camp's team has been studying this well for three years now. They are gradually getting an idea of what this site may once have looked like. Behind the administrative buildings adjoining the Agora, narrow little streets led into a cramped, densely built-up residential area. Here lived the common citizens, close to the place that contributed so significantly to the development of democracy. 
while there were certainly very rich houses and elegant villas, most of the houses we have near the Agora are very poor and not very comfortable. They have clay floors, their rooms are centered around a courtyard which would pro have provided some light and air, but they would have been very dark from our point of view, very badly furnished, probably not too many windows because you, no way of closing them off and still letting the light in. So I think that's one of the reasons that such an outdoor public life as being home wasn't all that much fun. The artifacts are analyzed and classified in the Institute's laboratory. Sometimes it's the small items that reveal a great deal about larger issues. The purpose and significance of these small bowls was a puzzle at first. They were found near the hearth in the dwellings of humble Athenians, alongside the burnt bones of small animals. They may have been sacrificial bowls for domestic religious rituals, asking the gods for health, happiness and success in business. Religion played a large part in Athenian daily life. The visible proof of that was the Parthenon. An elaborate frieze that once crowned the Parthenon illustrates the Athenians' relationship with their gods. It was originally painted, but the colors wore away long ago. The frieze shows the magnificent annual procession of the Athenians to the Acropolis in honor of their patron, Athene. The Panathenia was a colorful procession up the steep hill where charioteers demonstrated their skill at maneuvering their nimble chariots. Venerable elders accompanied the procession. Young men carried heavy amphoras of water. The Panathenia involved sacrificing animals to the gods. Such events were always a big celebration for everyone. There were no priests in democratic Athens. Athenians related to their gods in a relaxed and confident way. The gods frequently descended from Mount Olympus, taking on human form to mingle with mortals and enjoy themselves licentiously. But the gods demanded humility and absolute respect from mortals. The Athenians know that Praxiteles is working on a statue of Aphrodite, the goddess of beauty. And the rumors actually seem to be true. Phryne is the model for the image of the goddess. If gods take on human form, it's seen as an expression of their divinity. But for a mortal woman to allow herself to be represented as a goddess is a crime. By this presumption, Phryne puts her life and liberty at risk. In Athens, the well-to-do citizens were the chief patrons of artists such as Praxiteles. It was considered good form to support the arts. Greek culture flourished thanks to this spirit of patronage. Even today, the art of ancient Athens provides people with a livelihood. Reproductions of antique art objects are sold all over the world. The art of casting in bronze lives on in this Athenian workshop. 
It was one of the earliest technologies and has been practiced for over 4,000 years. A tripodon, a large bowl on three legs, is being cast today. A new mold is made for every casting and each of the many individual parts requires a separate mold. Generations of fathers have passed down to their sons the composition of a special kind of earth that makes it possible to produce these detailed casting molds. Έχουμε μάθει αυτή τη δουλειά από παπούδες πολλές γενές, από παπούς στο πατέρα, ο πατέρα στο γιο και ούτω καθεξής. Έτυχε να μάθω και εγώ αυτή τη δουλειά, τη συνεχίζω και θα τη συνεχίσω όσο να σταματήσουμε. Έχω αρκετά χρόνια στη δουλειά, περίπου 30. The mold for the underside of the bowl is ready. With an ordinary spoon. The bronze caster is digging channels into which the liquid bronze will later be poured. The inside of the bowl is decorated with delicate reliefs. This is the most difficult part because every detail must be correct before the molds are put together. The bronze has been heated for over two hours. Now the molten metal is poured into the molds. Από το μικρότερο μέχρι το μεγαλύτερο, το τυπώνεις και δεν ξέρεις στο τέλος αν θα σου βγει. Το να μην βγει υπάρχουν πολλοί τρόποι. Μπορεί να είναι το χώμα βρεγμένο πολύ, μπορεί να το σφίξεις πολύ, μπορεί να σου πέσουν χώματα, να μην κάνεις τις μπουκαδούρες σωστά και να μην σου βγει στο τέλος. Άγχος υπάρχει. Opening the earth mold destroys it. Now we will see if the cast has been successful. Piece by piece, the foundry workers lift the separate parts out of the steaming molds. There is still a great deal of delicate work to be done before the tripodon is completed. Tripodons played a special role in the ancient world. They were handed out as prizes to the patrons of successful plays. Frini, who financed a theatre group, also received such a prize. The Tripodons were placed on high stone pedestals in public view, lining the street leading to the theatre, which is still called Tripodon Street. The vast majority of ancient bronze artworks have disappeared, melted down by later generations. Many marble statues were burned to make lime. Textiles and almost all wood or leather artifacts have also been lost. The ancient world was colorful and traders brought exotic goods to Athens from all over the world. The market where today's inhabitants of the old city shop for their fresh fruit, vegetables, meat and fish. The ancient Athenians ate more modestly. Very few could afford meat. Poorer people ate it only when an animal was sacrificed for a special festival. Small animals were kept in the house and supplied milk and eggs. But Athens was close to the sea, so at least there was plenty of fish. 
which, with bread and thick lentil soup, formed a staple diet. Fruit and vegetables were very different from today's. The melons were tiny, apples rare, and it was two millennia before potatoes and tomatoes reached Europe. But in addition to figs and olives, Athenians were also fond of grasshoppers and cicadas, which Aristotle praised as great delicacies. It's fairly clear that Athenian trading connections were, were very extensive. A lot of their grain, maybe most of their grain, came from the Ukraine, from the north side of the Black Sea. Uh, they were importing wine from Asia Minor and the island of Rhodes. Uh, Athenian coins uh, have been found in Egypt. They've been found uh, practically as far away as Afghanistan and uh, far to the west as well. Now, the coins obviously can pass from hand to hand, uh, but uh, it's clear that goods came in from all over the world. Amphoras were the universal containers for transporting goods in antiquity. Hundreds were excavated at the Agora alone. Athens was a trading power, and democracy took up a great deal of citizens' time. But no one would lose money by taking part in political decisions. The potter who made these amphoras also received money when he went to vote. Outside the city gates were the city's quarries. In scorching heat, thousands of slaves cut the marble for Athens' magnificent buildings. It is estimated that there were three slaves to every free citizen of Athens. Today, the marble used to reconstruct the Parthenon is cut by a handful of workers using heavy equipment. The latest technology is used to cut the marble. Specialists drill holes several meters into the rock. Long steel cables set with diamond chips are threaded through the rock like a giant bandsaw to cut blocks weighing several tons. But the ancient methods of getting marble for buildings, such as the Parthenon, have not been lost either. The stone is still split the same way as it was 2,000 years ago, with heavy hammers, iron chisels, and a deep knowledge of the structure of marble. The gigantic blocks had to be transported many kilometers to the Acropolis. Carts, pulled by several teams of oxen, hauled the huge loads. And while in the city, splendid monuments were being erected to the glory of democracy, in the quarries, those at the bottom of society were slaving under the most inhumane conditions. Slavery was certainly a fact of daily life, and it's, I think, more a question of manpower than anything. Uh, but when we look at the records for the buildings on the Acropolis, we find that free Athenians, Greeks from other city-states, and slaves all worked on the building together, all doing exactly the same jobs, and all being paid a daily wage. Uh, and the, the lot of a slave varied tremendously. At the bottom end of the scale, they worked in the silver mines, and their lives must have been very hard and very short. Uh, there were slaves who were public servants, like accountants, uh, whose lives were not too bad. And some slaves even ran some of the major banks in Athens. Slavery was taken completely for granted, even in the enlightened democracy of Athens. While Athenian citizens were primarily concerned with politics, slaves guaranteed the commercial success of the city. Many slaves were well-trained artisans. Their work is the model for today's stonemasons on the Acropolis. New pieces for the Parthenon are chiseled from the blocks with utmost precision. 
When the chisels become blunt, the blacksmith provides new sharp tools. Like Hephaestus, the god of fire and forge, he has mastered the interplay of fire and water to produce hard steel. The finest tools for the best stonemasons in Greece. In the residential quarter around the Agora, buildings were constructed with much less care. Houses were small and cramped. Even though their inhabitants were not the rich of Athens, here too, archaeologists are uncovering shards of elaborately painted bowls and vessels. When restored, they provide an impressive image of Greek daily life. mostly reflects the aristocratic style of living, and there were plenty of aristocrats and rich people even in democratic Athens. Uh, there are some pots that show sort of normal activities in shops and fishmongers cutting up fish and butchers and people working in workshops, but generally the art is, is sponsored by the aristocracy and they're going to be interested in feasting and hunting and partying and the things that aristocrats like to do. Athenian democracy had deprived the aristocracy of power. Every citizen had equal rights, but not all citizens were equal. Many old aristocratic families harked back to a long tradition of privilege and still had considerable wealth and influence even in the democracy. They were the ones who could afford these costly amphoras. The best vase painters were famous throughout Greece and their work fetched high prices. Dimitris Tathopoulos carries on the art of the ancient masters with great passion. The secret lies in the paint. Liquid clay is used to paint the vases before firing. Only after they've been fired in the kiln do the vases acquire their characteristic color. But it isn't just the artistic or technical aspects of the painter's work that matter to him. When he pins someone from a pot of water, he doesn't use only 50% of the Greek system that he has in his hand. When he goes down from the pot and takes the water, he has another feeling. Because he takes all the water and he enriches the whole Greek system that we have in our hand. Όταν θα πει κάποιος από μία κύλικα, φτάνει το υγρό μέχρι την άκρη των χιλιών του και έχει μια τελείως διαφορετική αίσθηση. The symposia of Athenian high society were famous. In those days, symposium meant simply drinking session. <laughs> Rich Athenians attended lavish feasts with music and dancing. The symposia hosted by Phryne were legendary. Her guests were philosophers, artists and politicians. This evening, Praxiteles is the centre of attention. He has announced that he will soon unveil his statue of Aphrodite. The guests vie at telling tales, 
while drinking games and riddles amuse the men and their courtesans. In the course of the evening, the drinking bowls reveal their secret. Με τους κιματισμούς που μπορεί να κάνει μέσα το νερό ή το κρασί που έχει, η ζωγραφική που υπάρχει μέσα είτε αναφέρεται σε θεούς, είτε αναφέρεται σε ερωτικές πράξεις, είτε αναφέρεται σε αθλητισμό και τα λοιπά, κινείται και έχει μια αίσθηση επαφής με το Θεό ή με οποιαδήποτε παράσταση έχει μέσα. Συν τις άλλες, αυτές οι μεγάλες κύλικες μπορούσε κανείς να πει σχεδόν ξαπλωμένος γιατί αυτοί συνήθως καθόντουσαν επάνω σε ανάγκλητρα τα οποία ήταν μισοξαπλωμένος και πίνανε κατά αυτόν τον τρόπο. Ενώ η Νοχώος έβαζε το κρασί όπως αυτός ήταν ξαπλωμένος έπινε. But this evening, Freeney's symposium is disrupted. Praxiteles' slave would not normally be allowed to intrude, but the news he has rushed through the dark streets to tell is too appalling. This is the Dagen Pragmas in Bebeken, Gaiotis Paragnestai. Vrini has a premonition of the catastrophe. At the studio, their worst fears are confirmed. Intruders have broken in and smashed Praxiteles' work, thus revealing Freeney's secret. Now the whole city knows that Freeney intended to create the image of a goddess in her own likeness. No mortal has ever dared do this. disturbed the delicate balance between the worlds of the gods and of mortals. To ensure the continued benevolence of the gods on Mount Olympus, the Athenians established holy places throughout their realm. They honored more than their patron, Athene. The temple at Cape Sunion was dedicated to Poseidon, the god of the sea who protected shipping and trade with the colonies. Athens had established commercial links from Sicily to the Black Sea. There were even Greek settlements in Egypt. But the gods were known to be capricious. It was better not to rely only on them. To safeguard their influence and repel enemies, Athens maintained an enormous navy. Pride of the fleet were the triremes, war galleys with three banks of oars, which were able to protect the heavily loaded cargo ships. In the harbour at Piraeus, 200 of these ships were waiting to be deployed. 
One of the civic duties of Athenians was to crew these dreaded warships. Fully mobilized, the Athenian fleet required 40,000 oarsmen. While the rich could pay for the upkeep of the fleet and send their slaves to sea, the poor had no choice but to do the rowing themselves. Every trireme was manned by 170 oarsmen. They were often crammed together for days on end and the heat below deck must have been dreadful. At the beginning of the 5th century BC, the great strategist Themistocles convinced the Athenians to invest a large proportion of their national assets in the fleet, thus turning the city-state into a sea power. For a few decades, Athens dominated the Eastern Mediterranean and the numerous Greek city-states. But soon, the old conflicts broke out again and Greece became embroiled in seemingly endless wars once more. Warfare was virtually a, a yearly occurrence uh, and these are citizen armies so that virtually everybody must have fought quite frequently. They were all eligible for military duty from age 18 to 59. They had large land armies and they had those huge fleets that required tens of thousands of rowers. So I think most Athenians experienced war uh, several times in the course of their lives. Uh, it's, it's done seasonally, that is to say, if you're a farmer, you're gonna tend your fields first and then go fight your neighbor when you're not trying to get in your crop. But uh, it was a, a part of daily life, no question. The theatre provided distraction from daily cares. Under the guardianship of Mary Dionysus, the god of wine, playwrights pilloried often coarsely, the abuses prevalent in their society. Dignitaries and politicians in their seats of honor were often the targets of this public mockery. Theater was a democratic institution to which every Athenian had access. There was room for more than 17,000 spectators in the steeply tiered seating. Political decisions were made on the Penix, the place of the People's Assembly, an inconspicuous open space within sight of the Acropolis. Here, the first parliament in history assembled. The most famous orators of antiquity stood on these steps and addressed the citizens of Athens. Voting by show of hands took place on the Penix, the birthplace of democracy. Athenians lived in an information society. Every citizen was obliged to learn to read and write. During the excavations at the Agora alone, thousands of inscriptions on stone were uncovered. Public appeals, information for citizens, or funerary inscriptions like this stela. In a democracy such as the Athenian one, virtually the entire government would change every year, except for a handful of officials. And that means you need very, very good record keeping because not all the projects are going to stop in a year and somebody has to keep track of the money. So you have to say how much money you got when you became the grain commissioner, how you spent that money, and how much money you, you passed on the following year to the next grain commissioner. So essentially, uh, you have to have excellent record-keeping uh, because of this constant changing of the officials. The 
the Greek script has not changed in more than 2,000 years. This stela was erected in memory of a young woman whose name is immortalized here beside her husband's. No other culture has left behind so much written evidence as Athens. So we know that Phryne did actually live. However, whether the details of her story are truth or fiction is still in doubt. The court of Athens is in session. Phryne appears, flanked by her lawyer, Iperides, and is met by her accuser. Not even her influential patrons have been able to prevent the legal proceedings. Opinion in the city has turned against the famous courtesan. If the jury finds her guilty, she faces the threat of banishment, slavery, or even death. But Freni knows what she is doing. Hey, the Guinea blasphemia Senkos! Tall men, log on move, O Andres de Castai. To everyone's surprise, Iparidis does not dispute the charge against Freni. How so? He must slay the onimus. Then she herself provides the proof that her beauty is worthy of a goddess. If ever there was a mortal woman who might lend her body to Aphrodite, it is free. The independent judicial system was one of the greatest achievements of Athenian democracy. Citizens had no obligation to any ruler or god, only to themselves. A demonstration of this is the Propylia, which is also being restored. For 2,500 years, the Propylia has been the gateway to the Acropolis and the Parthenon. Like the Parthenon, the Propylia is being renovated in a historically accurate way. To this end, every stone is being removed cleaned of old mortar and restored. The architect Tassos Tanoulas is overseeing the work, first planned over 30 years ago. His interests extend beyond architecture. For him, the Propylia is a symbol of Athenian democracy. What appears to be a temple is not dedicated to any god. Rather, it is a place of leisure for the citizens of Athens. The Propylaea is uh, par excellence a secular building. I mean, and it, this is a new idea in uh, the uh, ancient Greek architecture. Uh, this is a building which was meant for the people. It had uh, benches all around, uh, along, all along the walls of the porches and the central building, and also uh, the rooms of the um, uh, wings which uh, were never built, or the Pinakotheki, which still is a room. They were meant for sacrificial meals, so they were for the people to, be, to enter them and to enjoy their architecture and luxury. So there was a temple's luxury in a secular building. For the first
first time in history, a splendid building such as the Propylia was not erected for gods or kings, but by citizens for the citizens of a free city. It is a symbol of the self-confidence and pride of democratic Athens. Phryne has been acquitted, and Praxiteles can now complete the statue to praise and honor Aphrodite. The historian Posanias reports that the goddess was flattered by Phryne's beauty, and the gods were reconciled with Athens. Though the original is lost, the statue is thought to be the first significant nude of a woman ever sculpted. The rise of Athens to a leading position among Greek cities was due to democracy, which led to an unparalleled blossoming of the arts and sciences in the 4th and 5th centuries BC. The power of Athens extended far beyond Greece and throughout the Mediterranean. But even in ancient times, the influence of the metropolis began to wane. Other cities took over its leading role, cities such as Alexandria, Carthage, and Rome. But none of those could dispute the place of Athens in history. This was the cradle of democracy.